legal accountability is the responsibility that our elected officials have to inform us of the work that they're doing and also our responsibility and obligation um, as citizens to hold them to account. Obviously, when you vote for an elected official at elections, you enter into some sort of social contract. And what happens there is they have a responsibility to deliver on the promises they made. And therefore, if there's a breach of this contract, you as the citizen are in a position to hold them to account in that regards. So when we speak about electoral accountability, it's one of the tenets of democracy. Democracy, as we know, is governance by the people. It's the will of the people. So you as a citizen have a responsibility, an obligation, a right and a say to ensure that the people that you put in office deliver to you as they say they have. There's a perceived lack of accountability in this country because of the electoral system that we have, which, as most people know, um, really gives power to political parties rather than to individual, say, members of parliament uh, and, and individual representatives. So we vote for parties, we don't vote for individuals. That has great advantages in some ways. It's a very fair system, but it does mean that party bosses have a lot of power over the people that they select to go and sit in parliament on our behalf. I think that's one reason. The other big reason, in my opinion, is that we have far too much loyalty to political parties, to movements, to history, to the past, uh, to the achievements of the past and so on. That's very common in countries that have undergone a liberation process, whereas the real loyalty and flowing from that the accountability should be to the voters, to the people. There definitely is a lack of accountability in Africa, um, and it's for a number of reasons. It's very, very complex. So a lot of people have spoken about how it's an issue of electoral systems. A lot of people have spoken about how, obviously, it's because of um, Africa's background, right? We've got a lot of African countries that come from a very authoritarian rule background. Um, so there are issues that play there. But I think at the end of the day, it's about power dynamics. So we can have a democracy, but if citizens do not have tools, if they don't have resources, if they don't have the information that they need and that they require to hold their electoral officials to account, then it becomes a bit of a problem. Voter education definitely is part of the problem because I think too many people feel that in a sense the politicians are their bosses or somehow superior to them and that once they've voted, they no longer have the right to expect uh, responsiveness or accountability from these kind of superior beings. And we do need to educate people to realize that in fact, all politicians are our employees. We pay their salaries through the taxes, so they need to give us an account just like any employee does to their employer. When it comes to voter education, we need to go beyond just preparing people to vote on election day. We've got to inform them about things like electoral code of conducts, where they go when you know a political party breaches this code of conduct, where they can complain, whether it's election day or whatever the case may be. So it's about you know presenting citizens with the tools, with the institutions, with the information and the resources that are available so that they can see what their options are, they can make decisions, and they know where to go for recourse. So obviously there's issues or institutions such as courts, but we know that obviously legal access in this country is very difficult, right? So I think one good thing about technology and internet and social media is it's allowed us to create a lot more awareness about causes and issues, right, that we're very interested in. And what that's done is it's given us the ability to organize ourselves much better and um, to put pressure, obviously, on our government and our leaders. So I think, basically, the tool that we need to maximize on is organizing ourselves um, around interests, around causes that we feel passionate about, and putting the adequate pressure on our leaders. And we've seen that happen a lot in South Africa with the Fees Must Fall protest, and now, obviously, the protests against gender-based violence. But we need to take it a step further, that beyond the protesting, beyond the social movements, can we get into a position where we can take a seat at the table and propose policy, propose solutions? And what we need to do is we need to start looking at parliamentary reform, where we can open the space of parliament and make it more conducive, not just to civil society organizations, not just to middle class, but make it a space where everyone can get involved and speak to issues that affect their daily lives. There are various mechanisms 
that are out there, many of them contained in the Constitution and other legislation. I'll give you a few examples. At local government level, we have ward committees where each ward councillor has to give a report back every year. They should hold regular meetings and people can apply to become members of the ward committees. Uh, you also have things at what you might call low-level democracy, things like school governing bodies, community police forums. These are all ways that people can get involved and deal with their political representatives. Parliament itself is very, very open. Anyone can go to Parliament at any time, just with your ID book, sit in on committee meetings, see what's going on. You can't necessarily interfere and say or say, but you can make submissions on legislation, on policy items. So lots of ways, formal and informal, uh, of doing it. And just look up your favorite political party's website, give them a call, write them an email, um, send them your concerns and your queries and see if you get a response. <music>